Welcome to We Got Balls, real, raw, masculine sex talk with Chris Inman and Scott Cohn. Chris and Scott both work with men who want to leave their unwanted sexual struggles in the past. They are willing to do whatever it takes to help men get curious about what drives their compulsive sexual behavior. With that said, here we go. Hey, Scott, we're finally here. We've hit the mother load. I was watching a TikTok today, and this TikTok was uh, was had this picture of these this couple, this man and this woman. And the sole picture of showing these two uh, people was they were showing one picture when they were teenagers and another picture probably like 15 to 20 years later when they were older. And the glaring difference was in the first picture, the woman was she was a teenager. She had small boobs. In the second picture, she had humongous torpedoes. Those knockers would have slapped you in the face and knocked you out. I'm sure there's plenty of guys who let that video scroll over and over and over and over. So guys, yes, today we're talking about big boobs. What do you think, Scott? So, so what you're saying is you were watching a tit talk? Not tit talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably okay. an app. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past them. They probably got I'm sure there's a web, Yeah, I'm sure there's a website yeah, for that. Yeah. Um, Don't look it up, but I'm sure there is. <laughs> So this is a big subject, but it <laughs> <laughs> it's um, with with huge ramifications. <laughs> really, yeah. <laughs> so, we can go on. Um, so this is, um, you know, we we've talked about what are the categories that make things sexually arousing for us, yeah. and we use this kind of three pronged approach to look at sexual arousal. What's a visual sexual cued interest sure what is a psychological cued interest and then what is a kind of a, a story or a narrative meta narrative uh interest that kind of blends all this together in our unique mm. kind of template for what makes things arousing yep and in the visual cued sexual interest category um breasts are um the number one well they're the number four body part that is looked for in pornography. Well, so when you look at porn searches, when you when you look at search data in Pornhub, for example, the number four body part that's searched for is breasts. And of course, it's always, most always it's modified with big, not always, yeah. but most of the time yeah. it's about big breasts. I think it's about four out of every five search is big breasts. The other ones are small, or small petite breasts, which is a whole other category, which I'm sure we'll get to in in the future. But if you think about art, if you think about history, if you think about, you know, culture, there's two body parts that always stand out. Number one, we've talked about penises. There's there's penises everywhere. But then there's the boobs. Is the big voluptuous boobs. I mean, Victorian art is all about being full-bodied, beautiful, bare-chested women. And there's there's this meaning and there's this arousal dynamic around big boobs. And I think there's a lot of good stuff here that we get to talk about. So when we get started, Scott, here's what I want to ask you. What is it that makes boobs so beautiful, so nurturing, and yet so erotic all at the same time? Uh, really good question. So just from a, a, a human design standpoint, what's our, what's our design? What's our telos? We have a, a somatosensory cortex in our brains that have a map of the human body. And that map highlights four areas, chest, breasts uh, for females, chests on males, uh, butts, feet, and penises. So we've talked about this in previous episodes. So we're, we're hardwired to notice breasts. Yep. And it's not hard to understand why that would be. We're also hardwired to notice butts. And on females, there is a universally preferred shape of a female body form. It's been documented in throughout history, through art and depictions of uh, females in sculptures, religious ceremony, sculptures, all, all that type of thing. It's still preferred today. And that's the voluptuous figure eight, right? The hourglass. So big breasts, the hourglass, yep. small waist to butt or hip ratio. Yep. And all of that is a signal for fertility, yeah. if you think about yep. it. So what do, what do big breasts represent? Yeah. 
to a male without him thinking about it. This is all again kind of operating in the subconscious level. And well, so the question is a man what age male? What age male are we talking about? Because are we talking about a two year old, one year old, or are we talking about an adult? We're talking about from birth, Chris, from because birth. we all okay. we are all born with a sucking reflex. Yeah. And that sucking reflex is designed specifically to take food out of our mother's body through her breasts. There you go. So this is a primordial way of receiving nurture, receiving comfort, yep, and receiving connection. So the bigger the boob, hard, hardwired. The bigger the boob, the more nurture, the more comfort, the more connection. So when I, when, that's right. So there's a real, uh, I, I like your word primordial. There's a real basic, that's my, that's my fourth grade word, basic desire to be able to, to live baked into me as a human being. And boobs are associated with that. Is that when I have something that can nurture me, that can bring me security, that can bring me war, warmth, and that I can feel connected because as a, as an infant, I was wrapped up in uh, my mom's body for nine months. And so now I get thrown out into this big world. And where am I going to find this experience of connection, except when I'm young, suckling at my mother's breasts? That's right. And so this is how we're made. Um, we And keep in mind those three factors of nurture, comfort, and a sense of connection because they drive our lives throughout our lives. Mm. But that's where we start to learn it yep. is at our mother's breast. Yep. Right. And I think there's a recognition of that even in, um, in the, the Psalms in the old Testament where David says like a weaned child rests against his mother's breast. I have learned to comfort and quiet my soul. There's a recognition in there that even as David as an older man is saying he recognizes the emotional comfort and sense of connection and soothing that he received at, at his mother's breast. But as he grew and was weaned from that, he had to learn to bring that to himself. That's talking about affect regulation yep. in the scriptures thousands of years ago. But this is a basic way that we are designed to connect to others. Yep. This physical touch, the sucking, the breast to even get our food. And so it's no mystery why that would become a source of comfort of physical pleasure of sexual delight as we wait become, wait, wait wait time out time out know. time out time out time out you just you just switched on me comfort pleasure and then you went to sexual delight what the hell scott come on we're talking about my mama you don't i'm a southern boy you don't talk about my mama like that scott that's okay where, gonna... where's where's the switch because I'm going to creep you out a little bit here because it's very common for little boys to get erections while they're suckling at their mother's breast. Uh, that's creepy. I'm not, we're not going to go back to that one. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not saying that's it's not true. I'm not saying it's not true, but I think it's important to make the connection between the human experience and the erotic experience that there's a point, And I would say, you know, as we're developing as human beings, if especially if there's a disconnection between healthy connection and sexuality, you know, we talked about earlier uh, being around people when you're naked and just being comfortable with your body, having open conversations about sexual. I mean, you know, back in uh, back in the day when parents had sex, they were in the same room with their kids. Their kids heard them having sex because you didn't you couldn't go anywhere else. So you knew that was part of it, what it meant to be in a relationship and to be intimate and connected. And now everything is so segregated and disjointed. In my mind, when you're talking about nurture and care, I hear that in a completely different wavelength from sexuality and eroticism. Hmm. Why is that? Uh, maybe Why does it seem so foreign yeah. that comfort and connection and sexuality are separate domains? I think because of the morality of it all is I was raised in an environment where there was good and bad. And of course, what amplified the good and bad of good and badness of things is the silence around it. The stuff that was good was talked about 
And the the one thing that was overarching in my upbringing, I was I grew up in a very religious household, was sex was only for marriage, and there were a bunch of rules about what you couldn't do sexually, and dot 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 dot. And so it was totally outcast, and it was shamed to talk about those things. And I'm not disagreeing that there's a connection there, but in my body, in my experience, I have a hard time connecting. I mean, even what you said, that little boys have erections uh, suckling at their, and I'm sorry, infants have erections suckling at their mother's breast seems bad. Like that's the word that comes to mind. It's bad to think about that because there mm -hmm. has to be a division. There's childhood and there's adulthood and the two can't mix. Yeah. Well, in one sense, we can honor that divide between adult and child, parent and child, not being a sexual relationship because we don't want that right. to occur. It's right. very damaging to people's lives. And there are forces in the culture now that are actually pushing to obliterate that line between children and, and adults and children and parents and just normalizing all kinds of sexual behavior. Mm. Like there's no limits. That's right. what the culture would have you believe. Yeah. I think we we both kind of embrace the idea that sex is beautiful and good and it's playful and should be adventurous yes. and exciting, but there has to be limits on it for it to be healthy and uh, kind and good. Mm. So there's there's cultural prohibitions against incest because there's really bad biological effects of inbreeding with close relatives. Yep. This is well documented. It's not mm -hmm. controversial. Um, you know, it's it's just part of our biology. So that's why those prohibitions exist is to keep us from doing further damage to ourselves and to future generations genetically. Yes. But at the same time, the way we learn to receive comfort, care, nurture is through touch. It's mm -hmm. one of the fundamental ways in which we come into the world and we're, you know, we have five senses, yep. sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. But think about how you connected with your mother. The first connection was to go back and to touch her breasts, to suck with your mouth. And you received not just comfort, but what you needed to survive. You needed your food that way quite interesting. Like we have to, we depend fully on another person to feed us with something from their body in the beginning. And so this gets really laid down foundationally as this is a foundational way for how I receive comfort and care and nurture, touch, and it's coming through breasts So for, in, all, for all of us. In the same way, when I was a teenager and I'm making out with the girl that I like, and we have a few chances to have these makeout session, where's the first place my hands want to go while I'm right. kissing her or your, or your mouth. Uh, like, yeah. I didn't get a lot of freedom on that one, but that's, but that's, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, well, but again, that's that, that that's that I did this, this symbolism of breasts of, of, of nurture and boobs, I think is really important to, to point out. And as we're having these conversations, uh, and we've said this, nothing is, is, um, nothing is prescriptive because, uh, everybody has a different arousal template and a different story in the context. But when, when you're really fetishizing big boobs, I think what we're fetishizing is that connection to nurture, right? That connection to being, what were the three words that you said that symbolize this? Comfort, connection, care, comfort, connection, and care. We're fetishizing, we are eroticizing, and, and by that, and I think the connection needs to be made, the things that we didn't have necessarily or that we had and maybe were taken from us when we were young, maybe too soon, those are the things that we eroticize and we are aroused by in adulthood. There is a direct connection between childhood and adulthood in this way. And it's hard for us to, to to get our minds around it sometimes, but it's absolutely true. And you may not even know that it's there. Yeah. Um, you may yeah. just behave in a way that you think is disgusting and perverted, and you don't understand why yep. you're that way. Yep. I've, I've coached guys who um, what really turned them on was sucking on a woman who had just given birth 
sucking on her breasts and basically drinking their her milk, yeah. her breast milk. Yeah. And that was an eroticized, fetishized uh, sexual act, really, but it's very, very specific to the breasts. Yep. Yep. Well, you get into their core story. Their mother left when they were babies. Yeah. Yep. Their mother abandoned them. So what are they? They're not even aware that they're reenacting that whole scenario of abandonment with, with, with their mom in their sexual longings and desires, but they are. They're they're looking again, one of the frameworks we look at fantasy always is through this lens of where's the harm in my life and how then do I fantasize about the opposite of how I've been harmed? Yep. So if my mom abandoned me and didn't want me, um, and that occurred during my breastfeeding time in my life, you can see how that easily then subconsciously gets eroticized as a way to alleviate my pain by going deeply into that in sexual pleasure. And I, I would add another layer to that. Maybe your, and this is my story. Maybe your mom was physically present, but emotionally struggled to connect. And so I'm looking for symbolic, uh, you know, ideas of nurture. And that topless woman with those big boobs feels nurturing to me. I see it. I'm aroused by it. It's a little forbidden. It's a little shameful, but I want to look at those pictures. I want to see uh, an example of, not I'm not trying to objectify my mother, but what I'm doing is channeling that desire that I wanted when I was young to objectify another person. And I think that's important to know that these are objects. I'm not looking at the person when I'm looking at big boobs. I'm looking at the part of the person that I want to consume to, to deal with my particular desires and, and needs in the moment. And so, we'll, yeah, so, yep. so that's, that's really interesting because um, Michael Bader, who's a psychoanalyst and has written a book that both you and I have kind of read, um, Male Sexuality, makes the point, I think it's a fascinating point that in the stages of sexual development in a person's life, you know, when, you, when you're born as a little boy, your primary caregiver in the Western world, for the most part, is your mother for the first 18 months of your life. Yep. And same for little girls. But at around 18 months of age, children start to become aware of themselves as not just an individual, right, as a self, mm. but as a sexual self. Mm. So we start to become aware of our genitals and our body types and how we differ maybe from our mother and we're more like our father if we're boys and as girls, you know, they, they relate to their mother. But there's a transition that for a boy to transition um, out of feeling kind of this attachment with his mother into owning his masculinity, this is what Bader says, is he has to not only reach out to attach to his father, he has to reject femininity in some way. Yeah. He has to reject that he's not feminine. Where women never have to make that transition, women also, girls, will pull apart from their mother, but they don't have to reject their mother's gender because they're the same gender. Right. Little boys have to reject their mother's gender. And as a result of that, pushing her away, so to speak, emotionally, a lot of guys feel shame or guilt subconsciously about pushing their moms away, particularly if they have very anxious moms or very uh, disengaged moms. And so then what does their fantasy end up looking like as a teenager? It's imagining this woman who has ample breasts and the representation of that is she's got all I need yes. to satisfy me. Yes. Whereas my mother, because she was always anxious, I could never get enough from her. Mm. Right. Mm. So the woman with big breasts gives me all I need. She's more than happy to have me touch her breasts, suck her breasts. It doesn't bother her at all. And, you know, so we're, again, we're reversing that sense in which our relationship with our mother seemed very restrictive, or I could never, you know, I could never get her attention. I could never get her to give me enough. So I think when, when a person's really struggling with this as a particular uh, focus of their sexual arousal, I'm not talking about all men are attracted by breasts. Okay. So th there's a, there's a, just a kind of a baseline attraction to breasts because this is a hardwired body part yep. that we're going to find arousing and interesting. Yep. But then there's the fetishization of that where it takes it to a whole new level that says, I got to have that. I got to have that. Right. Like 
I can't fantasize about a woman that doesn't have triple D cups. Yep. I need those big breasts. What's it saying about my story? Right? Yeah. Because it's taking that visual sexual cue and now it's extending it way beyond what would be considered kind of a, a common um, attraction to that area of the body. Well, and, and I want to say that there's a spectrum everywhere in between. You know, you use the word common and common just means that there's a larger number there than it doesn't mean you're any more or, or less um, healthy or not. Is that everybody has their story. Everybody has their attractions. Everybody has, uh, I like to call it their flavor of ice cream. So if your flavor of ice cream is big boobs, well, then this was your episode. If your flavor of ice cream is, uh, was MILFs, then, you know, you need to check out a previous episode. If your flavor of ice cream is something else and we haven't talked about it yet, then stick around because we're probably going to get to it. Because whatever it is that turns you on, whatever it is that really you can't get enough of the visual cues and the psychological cues is the investigation of what is in your story. What is it about your particular narrative that's driving you to find peace comfort, security, connection, all those things that got that, that Scott talked about uh, in that experience, that artificial, let me make that very clear, artificial intimacy experience. We're not trying to stigmatize anybody up around what arouses them. We want to invite curiosity because when you explore those things that really turn you on, you're going to find the reason for them. But if you don't ever look at those, if you don't ever examine those, they're just going to operate in your life in this very confusing and maddening way. And why am I driven to this over and over and over again? So to be able to sit with some kind guides or friends who know how to do this kind of work and just be curious with you of like, why big breasts? Why is that such a turn on to you? Like, when did that start in your life? What do you think that means? And just ask some questions that invite you to more curiosity around that, yeah. that particular issue. So anyway, this has been a fascinating episode for, for us, I think, to talk about big boobs, mm -hmm. uh, why big boobs are important to a lot of guys. And again, we just want to invite everybody that's listening to our podcast to become more curious about what it is that turns you on and how that might have started in your life. Because there's a story there. There's some hard wiring, uh, visual sexual cued reasons for that. And there's a lot of psycho dynamic reasons for those things that arouse you that arouse you. So we're inviting you to kindness towards yourself, curiosity, and be willing to explore that openly and find the reasons for those things, because it can bring you a lot of uh, joy, peace, and contentment in your life. So thanks for being with us. You can find out information about either Scott uh, or Chris by clicking on the links in um, uh, the show notes. And we'll look forward to talking to you next time. Take care, guys. Have a good day, everyone. Don't forget to subscribe for more episodes. You can connect with Chris at pornfreemasculinity.com and with Scott at successfulmen.com.